Samuel 12, verse 15. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. All right, this is, this is where the Lord brought me tonight, that disappointment with God. David therefore inquired of God for the child, and David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his household stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to our voice. How then can we tell him that the child is dead, since he might do harm to himself? But then David saw that his servants were whispering together, and David perceived that the child was dead. So David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, yes, he's dead. So David arose from the ground, and he washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and then he requested, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servants said to him, what is this thing that you have done while the child was alive? You fasted and wept. And when the child died, you arose and you ate food. And he said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now that he's died... Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And will I go to him? But he will not return to me. And uh, I just saw the Lord bringing that scenario to my mind. And that place where David gets up to go and worship the Lord in that place. And I just saw that that is the, the crossroads the Lord has many of us in. It might not be in, in a tragedy of the loss of a child, but there's lots of things like that where we, we've, we've come through these past few years here and we all have our own personal stories and our own things that we've walked through. We have our own judgments and things that we've been working out with the Lord. Uh, but in general, the world is disappointing us. It's not the world we expected it to be. We haven't had the options and the choices and, and the liberties that we've we've been expecting from the Lord. And I was just being reminded tonight of Hosea 2. Uh, remember the one night we were sitting here in prayer and the Lord was saying uh, that he was cutting off all, all those, um, that, that road to Egypt and, and putting up a, a boundary there. And, and he, that he's the one bringing the famine and he's the one withholding the grain and all these things. And so we're, we're living in days where our perspective and our response to these things, to these disappointments and to these things, uh, the plan of God not being what we expected it to be. It's so important how we respond to these things because it determines our outcome. It's going to determine, like I said, that disappointment very easily turns into disillusionment and then despising the Lord. But so it's in that place, I just felt the Lord saying tonight, we, we need to talk about Thanksgiving, we need to talk about worship, we need to talk about abiding in the presence of the Lord. Because that, that's the secret. That's the secret that David learned, was that place of, I run to the Lord. I need to, I need to get up off the floor in this place. God has made a choice. While there's time, we pray. While there's an opportunity to repent, we turn around. But there's a point where it's, it's God makes his choice, and I need to move on past this place. And I just felt that uh, we were praying this morning, and I just felt that that was the response of the Lord from, from the message we heard Sunday. Um, I know this, this is in context to Israel, but I heard the scripture this morning that, you know, uh, you, you've been bruised by him, but he'll, he'll heal you. He's going to bandage you. 
And it's that choice of, you know, there is a time where the Lord is bruising, but there's also a time where he's bandaging. But there's times when the Lord wants to move on to bandaging and we're still stuck in the bruising. And I just felt the Lord giving us that choice tonight. That choice. Are we going to get up and worship or are we going to stay in that place in the floor? Because the world's moving too quickly. God's plan is moving too quickly by. And you're going to get stuck. If you stay in that place of indecision, you're going to be stuck there. You're going to be stuck there. And that's going to be your fate. But uh, we, can't, we can't think that we get to stay in a, in a constant place. Do you know? Like I, I've always said indecision is a decision. And we think that we can stay in a place of, of, um, of complacency and somehow uh, we'll be in the same place five years from now if we, if we make that choice. No, no. Like the, the times we're living in, it's, it's, it's that tide of the ocean. You know, you go out and you think you're standing in one spot. But then if, if you keep kind of looking back, you know, your beach towel and thing was right in front of you. And then you look up again and it's, it's all the way down, down the way, you know, because that, that's our relationship with the Lord. Wherever we think we're staying, there is no staying there. You have to make a, a constant choice to abide in him, to stay in him, to run to him and constantly check your bearings in that place. And um, we were praying this morning and. I saw, I saw Moses. I saw Moses standing with the serpent on the stick between the living and the dead. And I just keep hearing this is choose life. Choose life or death. That, that's the choice before you. You have life or death. And, and how, how realistic was that choice, right? We have Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, right? Blessings and cursings. And choose life. Choose death or life, but please choose life, right? But... You know, Moses had to prophesy all that to them. But how, how, how severe when the plague was breaking out. And he has to lift up the staff with the snake on it. And he literally has to position himself. And it says, that the phrase in it is amazing. It says, he literally stood between the living and the dead. And what a dramatic, like if they ever made a movie of the Bible, what a dramatic scene as that. Moses had to hold up the serpent because the plague was breaking out because people had uh, violated the holiness of God. They hadn't walked in, in, in that place of abiding in what the Lord had prescribed. And so in that place, this plague is breaking out in their midst. And, and Moses is positioned. He's told to hold up the staff with the snake on it. And, and that those who look up on it will be healed. And those who don't are going to die. And they're literally all dying in this midst. And they have to run out in the midst of it. And they have to look up at that. And I saw the temptation. I saw so many leaders and Christians in that position of Moses. And the temptation to look down and pity the dead. And be like, oh, you know, if only I could go to them. If I could help them kind of lift up their head to make them look up. And I saw in that place, um, <laughs> you can't really look down and hold something up. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He has to uphold this and they have to look up at it. But I saw every time he kind of went, went down like that to have pity on the dying, the, the standard dropped. Yeah. And I just saw that kind of thing of the Lord saying, no, you need to look up. You need to look up. You fix your gaze. You fix your gaze on the Lord. You fix on, on what he's doing, on his healing, all of that. And you just stand as a witness between them. But don't look to the right or the left. Don't you turn. Don't, don't pity them. They're making their choice. How easy just to look up. I mean, like, look up. But the rebellion in their heart, they didn't want to. And in that place of rebellion, right, we all got corrected on Sunday. <laughs> okay? The point is, get over it. Accept it and get over it. Be, be, have a posture of repentance. Have a posture of correctability. Have a, have a posture of praise and worship to the Lord. Uh, let's turn to Psalm 51. Uh, this is out of that place of brokenness and correction and the prophet coming to David. I, I, I'm assuming this is in, in that time of fasting. Psalm 51, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly 
thoroughly uh, for my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, only you, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Wow, what a posture. That's repentance, guys. None of this fake, phony Christian repents. Oh, I'm sorry you were hurt. No, it's Lord, Lord, I'm wrong. You're right. I lift up your name. I deserve what I'm getting. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in, in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part you will make me no, no wisdom. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. So again, we've been bruised, but we're being healed. We're being bandaged. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. And then I will teach transgressors your ways. So, you know, he goes on to actually live in the testimony of this thing. That's, that's when repentance has fully worked in you. You know, don't say you've learned a lesson until you can preach out of it and live it afterwards. You know, don't give it a week because next week you're going to be at the same problem again. No, actually go through, let it fully work its course in you. And then, and then you can teach others at that place. And sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from my blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation, that my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. But you, you are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So, so remember Esau, he felt despised of the Lord. And see, when you feel despised of the Lord, you despise him back. But what happens? What happens if you have a broken and contrite heart? If you're correctable and humble before God, you'll see him. The humble will see God, right? So it's that correctability, it's that humility before the Lord and, and, and getting up from that place and choosing to praise him instead of, oh God, you're disciplining me. Your hand is very heavy on me, you're, right? I'm, I'm disappointed in this. It didn't come out the way. See how that turns to bitterness. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering, and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. And so what, what's the point? He does delight in those sacrifices. There is a time for bringing those things. Lord, there's a time for bringing all the praise and all the words and all the deeds and all the, all the service and all of that kind of stuff. But we've deduced the gospel to, to all of that without the broken heart, without the contrite heart, without doing the inner part. So it's that, that, that's the cleaning that God's doing. He's, he's cleaning out that inner part so that we can, we can go the long haul for him. And then out of that place, we can offer sacrifices. We can, we can um, you know, preach of what he's done. And we can go and do things out of that place. But don't rush on to that until you've done the, the heart business with God. Otherwise, that's why we have so many heresies in the church. Because people are preaching out of brokenness. They're, they're preaching out of disappointment. They're, they're twisting scriptures to, to fit their experience instead of letting their experience and their disappointment and all that with the Lord fully have its course in them. And cause them to, to repent and fall prostrate before the Lord. And then be restored in him. And then receive the true, the true message. And, and, and actually be able to bring those, those things to him. That's why people say, oh, the law was so heavy. We can't, we can't please God. That can never make anyone righteous. No, that's false. 
The problem what the fault was on the worshiper. The fault was on the worshiper. We have to we have to let that thing have its course in us. We have to give the Lord uh, the repentance and the healing and the and the, the right mindset that's due to him. Psalm 8. Oh Lord, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. Sorry, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man? What is man that you take thought of him? And the son of man that you care for him. You know, so much of our attitude problem against the Lord is we think way too highly of ourselves. But if we realize how low we are and let that sink in for a bit and accept that state, and then we realize how the Lord says, be lifted up, right? Then, then we can come into right standing with God. But if we try the lifting up before the base the baseness of man, right? Then, then we're not we're not in right standing before him. Do you understand? We're trying to skip again, like the repentance thing. We we just want to get it over with. Nobody likes saying sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, let's move on. You know, like we we rush through things. So, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God. And you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. And you have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So that's Psalm 63. Oh, God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you, and my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. Amen. Psalm 73, we're doing that Psalm of Asaph where it's talking, I'm looking at the, the ways of the wicked and how they prosper and things like that. And it, it, it looks like that, doesn't it? And again, God's checking all of our attitudes because we all keep getting the same themes from the Lord. the Lord. The Lord wants us to really get this in us and move us on from this place, okay? What, it, what happens? He's giving out and then he what? He goes into the sanctuary of the Lord. He goes in and then he sees and considers the, the goodness of God. And all of a sudden his perspective changes. Okay, and that's the thing. We need to get up, repent, be bruised, but then let the Lord bandage you. Let, let him get you up off the floor. All right, and in that place, then we choose that posture of praise and thanksgiving and, and abiding in his courts. All right, there's a whole thing, um, the temple right? There's an altar outside, okay? And inside, once you've gone through all of that, it's like the airport, you know, you don't get to go on the flight until you go through customs and they screen all your stuff and all of that and they take away your nail clippers and things like that, okay? There's an altar outside, but it's outside, the point is you come through, you do that business with the Lord so that you can ascend up the steps into his holy places, okay? And do you know what I've found all these years in the church? We've deduced Christianity and our walk with God to that space outside of his courts. Most of the relationship and business we do with God is outside. And it's like this vicious cycle of that. And if you stay in that place, it is discouraging. Because <laughs> you're like, oh, there's a lot of death and guts and blood out here. Okay? That's what went on out there. Okay? But the whole point of that is you're not, 
supposed to live out of that place. Right? Remember Psalm 73. He's considering all the stuff that's going on outside. And remember, what was it, Tuesday night? Kyle's talking about, you know, there is a weeping and a grieving. And, and Patty shared that about, about uh, Ezekiel and those who lament. Those who weep over, over the things that are going on. And there, there's a brokenness of, of realizing the state of the world and the state of things and all that. But if you stay in that place, that will weigh you down. Okay? So examine that. But then you need to go to the strategy. You need to go to the source. You need to go to the healing. Okay? Again, the bruising, the humility, the repentance. But then get up from there. Ascend from there. Okay? And in that place, we need to learn to be satisfied there and not come out. Remember Joshua? Moses had to go deal with the people. God bless him. And then, what? Joshua stayed. He abided in the tent. And and amazing, the faith, the tenacity that that man had. So Joshua, how did he have such an overcoming attitude in the midst of like, fighting wars against giants and major cities and walls and saying horrible things because he learned to dwell in the courts of the Lord because your loving kindness is better than life my lips will praise you so I will bless you as long as I live I lift up my hands in your name my soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness like the good, the good stuff. And my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meet, I meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. I have that underlying, clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go down to the depths of the earth. They will, you see, everything's in proper perspective here. He's got problems. Is he meditating on his problems? No. He's meditating on the Lord. And from that place, he gets proper perspective. He says, well, those... They, there's people seeking my life to destroy it. This is a psalm of David, so we know that that's true. It actually says, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. So why is it talking about a dry and weary land? Because I've been to that land. I've been where he was hiding from Saul in the wilderness for years. And it is a really dry land. Okay? In En Gedi, there's this beautiful spring. It's like this waterfall that just shoots out of the rock. But you, you have to hike You have to hike a good bit in the desert, in the heat of the desert, up this mountain, into the clefts of the rocks. And then you hear this rushing water. And then you can feel the temperature kind of like drop. And then all of a sudden you say, oh, I found David's spring. And so guys, like that hike up into En Gedi, there is rest, there is refreshing, there is uh, sustenance in the things of God. I'm telling you. The problem is we haven't gone through the effort of getting into that place, of hiking up into that place, of getting past the altar and getting into his sanctuary. And we haven't been good at staying there. David camped out in caves there for ages. And then we get all these lovely things about you're my rock and my hiding place and my shelter and my place of perpetual dwelling. See, you can talk about that stuff, but living it's another thing. And I found not enough believers live out of that place. And so we need to learn to delight ourselves in the Lord. Anyway, he's talking about how uh, in that place, he's contemplating his enemies, right? And he says, um, those who seek his life to destroy it, they will go on to the depths of the earth, into the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be a prey for foxes. But the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him will glory, for the mouths of those who speak lies will be stopped. Amen. 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 So, so do you know what? That's the thing. All of a sudden, all of our stuff gets put in proper perspective if we fight 
to get into that place of abiding, of refreshing, of healing in the Lord, okay? So we have a choice. We have a choice. We can be disappointed, and disappointment will lead, lead us into despising God, or we can choose in that place of disappointment to run to the Lord, to fall prostrate before him, to go through that business with him, to, to go through that, that, that anointing and that cleansing and that holiness thing and go up into his presence. But don't stop. Don't stop. Stop for like, you know, there's actually, in Angeli, there's little pools, kind of as you go. And some people, it's so hot, a lot of people just settle to go in there. But if you do the big hike all the way to the top, there's a big pool at the top, and you get to swim under the waterfall. It's so cool, it's so beautiful. But again, we settle for little things of refreshing. And then we get up and we go on our hike, you know? But... But if you continue, if you persevere in the Lord, there is great refreshing. And learn, learn to stay in that place. David dwelt in that place. And out of that place, he, he, he wrote so many lovely things to teach us about that place of thirsting. John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. We like it when it says those who don't bear fruit, they get pruned. And those that bear fruit, they get a prize and nothing bad ever happens to them. So we like that place of complacency. We like that safe place. But no, it's always like, you, you got to give all or nothing. you got to give all or nothing. And, and if you give it all, and, and you get it all. But it's that constant thing, well, I gave it all yesterday, I, so I don't want to give it today. No, you have to give it all every day. <laughs> because that's what pruning is. He wants to give you more fruit. All right? Um, remember the guy with the talents, you know? It, there's no such thing as like, oh, well, I'll just keep what you have buried in the ground. Once you have that attitude, you've judged. What's he say? You've judged God. He said, you're a hard man, right? But those who know him, they invest, you know, they don't keep it at a status quo. They, they add an invest to an investment, and then God rewards even more. So when we go through the pruning, when we go through the investment, he makes more of us, right? But it comes in that place of humility and letting God prune us. Uh, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. So he says, you can't bear fruit unless you abide in him. Do you know what happens if you... Like, we we're talking about that refreshing place, right? That cultivated place. And then we have the desert place, right? What happens if you bear fruit and then you try to take that fruit and go live and bear fruit in the desert place? Do you know what you get? Prunes and raisins. <laughs> Sorry. It's just a cheeky image I got. But it's true, right? It shrivels up. It dries out. You got dried fruit. You know? So it's that thing. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? We try to take the concepts of God, and then we go outside of his presence, and then we try to continue doing those things outside of him. So we do that. We kind of, we jump in and out of his presence. And we're used to that, and that's normal to us. That's just become our normal life. So we need to abide in him so we can bear much fruit. And in that place, we're going to experience his pruning. And I think that's why a lot of people leave his presence, too. Because it's abiding. You don't have to go outside every time. When you feel the pruning of the Lord, stay in him. You don't have to go back to getting saved again, you know? Like, I remember as a kid, that was the only concept I had. We felt like we had to get rebaptized every single time that we, re you know, do you remember that? Were there altar rededications? You know, certain denominations, you understand what I'm talking about. They would do an altar call. And, and you're like, well, I'm ar I already got saved, but I feel like I have more stuff going on in my life. So I guess I'll have to do the altar call again, except it's called a rededication, you know? <laughs> so 
I think like as a pastor's kid, I probably rededicated my life to Jesus every week, you know, and that's a good thing. But like, there's more than that. You don't have to go outside, back out to the altar. You don't have to get rebaptized every single time you blow it. You just repent and you, you say, okay, God, I'm experiencing your pruning, but I, I want to stay in here in your presence. I want to abide in you and let, you know, let, let that, that, that sap flow through me while you prune me a little bit. And you know what? I have some plants. I love pruning my plants. And some of them get like, I have some euphorbia, and it, it leaks and oozes this, this you know, latexy kind of sap. It can irritate your skin a bit, right? So sometimes the pruning, we get a little oozy, okay? But stay in him. The, the, the oozing means you're actually in him. If you're out of him and you get pruned, no sap comes out. So I think that's actually the state. I actually think maybe that's a sign of a lot of people's place with God is they, they're not really in him. And so they don't actually have the proper response when they are pruned. They don't necessarily have what, what's James said, James 4, be miserable, weep, wail, and mourn. Right? There's, there's a lot of people trying to repent and try to have a relationship with God without the weep, wailing, and mourning. Well, if you're not oozing, you're probably not in the vine. So stay in that place. Stay abiding in him. Let him prune you. Don't run away every time. Stay in that place. And you will, you can pr- be pruned and be bearing fruit at the same time. I'm telling you. So gardeners are afraid to do that to their plants, but they do. They're amazing. They're resilient. The more you prune them, the more they come back. But you'll never know that if you don't trust him and let him do it in your life. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and they cast them in the fire to be burned. But if, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, that's the other thing. We can't just be Holy Spirit people. We have to be abiding in his words. It goes on to talk about if you love his commandments, right? The Holy Spirit will actually speak these things in you. And again, that's a part of the pruning too, because while you're sitting there having this nice moment feeling the love of God, all of a sudden you feel some pruning coming. And he's saying, no, you're not really walking in my righteous standard in that area. And again, we have a choice in that place. Are we going to stay in the presence of God and say, yes, Lord, you're right, I'm wrong. Or are we going to say, hey, I'm offended by that. You know, come out of his presence. So, so let, his, let his presence flow in you. Let his correction work in you. Meditate on his law day and night. Let it be a comfort to you while you're on your bed, while you're walking, while you're talking with people. Let, let that be on, on your mouth. 21. All these things they will do to you. It's talking about persecutions and things. For my name's sake. Because they do not know the one who sent me. Do you know that a lot of the disappointment we have with God is actually really not fair to put on God because we're actually disappointed by people who don't love God. They don't love him. They're not in him. And we feel disappointed and hurt in those relationships, but they really don't love the one who who sent Jesus. They don't love Jesus. We're being persecuted for his name's sake. So why, why do we judge God for that? Why do we expect them to love us like that? Why do we form offenses at God because of those people? Again, it tries to pull us out of the vine. And it says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would, have, uh, would not have sin. But now, they have no excuse for their sin. I have that underlined. No excuse. Why? Because he's come. He's, he's, his gospel's gone out. They've all heard a witness of him. If they're around you, they've heard a witness of him. But what? They reject him. And now they have no excuse, and so they have to be proved and dealt with. And if they don't repent, if they don't turn in that place, they're going to be thrown in the fire and burned. And we have to accept that. That's God's kindness. That's his love. Again, remember Moses standing between the living and the dead? Don't look down. Don't be pitying them. Keep your eyes on him. Stay, uh, abide in him. Stay in his law. Stay in his deeds. And don't let the, that disappointment come in you. Because it says, he who hates me hates my father. 
And uh, it goes on to continue in that and talk about the helper and um, how he's going to come. It says that, you know, that they're, they're disappointed because he has to go away. But he says, it's better for me to go because then the helper's, the helper's going to come, right? And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will no longer see me and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. But so what's the bit? The, the Holy Spirit in that place, we're going to hear of his righteousness. We're going to hear of his judgment. We're going we're gonna to hear these things concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. But that's the role of the Holy Spirit. So every time you feel that pruning, every time you feel that judgment, every time you, you hear sin brought up, don't, don't pull away. Don't feel like you have to run back outside of the altar. Confess that there, in that place. And I'm telling you, if we learn to practice that closeness and abiding in the Lord, in that place, we're going to find the healing. We're going to be near him. That, that thirst in our life, instead of being satisfied in the world, we're going to be satisfied in him.